you have your Bibles uh, with you, I'd invite you to turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 18, <clears throat> starting at verse 1. I've been going through a series of messages here that I've entitled Learning from Jesus. There's so much we can learn from Jesus, both in his doctrine uh, and also his example in how he related to people in the words that he said. Um, before I do that, though, this morning, um, I've entitled the message Led by the Father. And I just, I think there's so much that we can glean as we consider how Jesus related to his Father and how he surrendered and yielded to his Father and how he recognized the will of the Father in his life. And, and so before we start that, I just wanted to see a perspective here out of the book of Jeremiah, uh, verse 18, starting at verse 1. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. You know, as I look at that illustration, um, God is, was telling Jeremiah, go to the house of the potter and watch as he molds and shapes vessels according to his will. And then as Jeremiah is observing what the potter was doing here, he's seen that the potter was unsatisfied with a vessel, um, so he reworked it into another vessel. And so... God was asking Jeremiah to consider this question. And he said, can I not do with you as this potter has done? That's the question I'd like us to consider this morning as we think about the will of God. Can God not do with you and me as he so chooses as the potter? Can God not decide to orchestrate our life according to his will? as he chooses to. I think that's a question we ought to ask ourselves at the onset of our life, in the middle of our life, at the end of our life. Can God not choose the, the direction of my life according to his will? And when we look at the example of Jesus, we'll, we'll see that Jesus, number one, he always recognized that the kingdom of God started with God. That God was... Um, the originator of the work, that all kingdom work be begun with him. When God first created the heavens and the earth and, and the fish and the birds and the animals and mankind and set them on the face of the earth, we know that, that God started it all. He made it all. He was always there. He was, he's, he's infinite. He has no beginning and no end. Um, he's the Alpha and the Omega. When we think about those things, we're also reminded that from creation all the way to redemption, to present day, God has always enacted his will. Even Jesus, at the, the end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, before he ascended to heaven, he, he claimed, proclaimed to the disciples, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. There, there's was a sense of, of sovereignty that came with the Father and with His Son, Jesus. But Jesus Himself demonstrated um, throughout His life His submission to the Father's will. And if we want to learn something from Jesus, that's something that I would encourage us to consider this morning. In John chapter 17, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, notice this, he says, God as the Father has given him, Jesus, authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So, so in his high priestly prayer there, as Jesus was praying to God, he, he says this statement, he says, you have given him authority over all flesh, the Son. 
and that God had given him authority to give eternal life to all whom the Father had given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then verse 4, he says, I glorified you on earth. As, as Jesus is reflecting on his earthly ministry, he says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So as Jesus was reflecting on his earthly ministry and on his work, he recognized that everything he had accomplished had been done because it was the will of the Father. That God had given him direction. That everything that he pursued on the earth had been because the Father had given him direction. So Jesus could say as he's reflecting, he could say, I've accomplished the work that you gave me to do. That you gave me to do. It says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And then in verse 6, he says, I have ma manifested your name to the people. Which we could maybe, in our modern day language, we could say, Jesus was saying, I've revealed your name to the people. I revealed who you are to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. Remember, um, Jesus is again saying, these words originated from God. So he says, I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them, and they have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying for those who you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So Jesus was emphatically preaching to his followers, even in his prayer. He was letting them know that I have always done the will of the Father, and, and the work has originated from the Father, and I have preached the good news to all those whom the Father has given to me, to how the Father has directed in my life. And then in John chapter 6, I want to look at another passage here. In verse 35, it says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you, that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Then in verse 37, he makes an extraordinary claim here. He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Let's consider those thoughts a little bit. In verse 37 there, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me I will never cast out. That's an interesting thought. You know, some, some theologians refer to something called irresistible grace. Meaning that, that when God opens up your eyes to see his magnificence and reveals himself to you, that it's almost impossible. In fact, Jesus would say that here. He would say, all that the Father gives me will come to me. They will come to me. All that the Father gives me, they will come to me. And whoever comes to me, he says, I will never cast away. I will never turn away from them. You know, when I, I look at my own life, I don't think um, that we need to consider this as a controversial passage. I know that, that in different areas of Christianity, sometimes this is viewed as, as controversial. And often we're filled with anxiety and we think, well, what if God doesn't choose me? What if God, God doesn't, hasn't, hasn't predestined me, He hasn't elected me, and I'm not a part of, 
of um, the chosen people of, of God. And I think sometimes we, we overthink that thought. And we lose sight of, of what Jesus is saying in this passage here. In verse 40, he says, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. So yeah, there, there's a part of, of the, the gospel of God that is irresistible. When I look at my own life, I see that. And I, it doesn't take me too much to, to, to kind of consider how the Lord has drawn me to himself over the years. And many of you can do that too. If, you, if you're willing to, you can look at your life. You can look at your childhood. You can look at, at how you were raised up and you can see the fingerprint of God at various moments in your life where he wouldn't abandon you. You know, in, in, my, in my years, I had the privilege of having a mom who really loved me. And she loved all her children. You know, we, we as seven children grew up without a dad because um, he, he died prematurely at an early age. We had a, a caring mom who was committed to teaching us the Word of God. And so she, her, uh, she was burdened to send us to a Christian school where we would learn from childhood on the Scriptures. And I look at that already, and I can already see in my life, I can see the hand of God. I can see God laying this burden on my mom and, and having this desire to see us um, under the nurture and admi admonition of the Word of God. And so throughout my years, though, um, unfortunately, I didn't always follow God. There were moments in my teenage years, too, where I was rebellious against God, where I went my own way, and I turned away from God. You know, there's been other moments in my life where, where I've given into the flesh and into the enemy. One of the things, though, that I have recognized Throughout my life, and, and I realized that even in my teenage years, when I would be attempting to turn away from God, the, the Lord would give me a distaste for the world and evil. And all along, God never abandoned me. There were moments where he left the 99 and pursued me. And, and so to this day, uh, when I look at my life, I can't turn away from God. There's, a, there's something that is irresistible about the Spirit of God that makes me turn to Him. In, in, in various moments throughout my life, I see and sense and I feel and experience um, the great hand of God pulling me to Himself, drawing me to Himself, revealing His love to me over and over again. And I am sure there's many of you here this morning who can testify to that. I mean, the fact that you are here this morning sitting on these pews reveals to me that God has not given up on any of you. You know, you, you wouldn't have had to come here today. You could have stayed in bed sleeping. Many are doing that right now. You could have gone out for brunch. You could have gone and, and invested into an addiction that you might have. Um, you could get involved in and extracurricular activities, and you could, you could be doing all kinds of different things, but you're here today. Why are you here today? This is a question I think you should ask yourself. What, is, is there something about the divine purpose of God that caused me to be in this place at this moment, at this time? Is there a reason why God has led me to this place today? I think there is. When I look at this verse here, it says here that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And, guess what he says here? More. And I will raise Him up on the last day. Isn't that beautiful? If you can say here today that I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart, I surrender my life to Him, you look, it means you're looking on the Son and you're believing in Him, and you're, you're taking His will over your will. 
And then God has this promise, I'm going to raise him up. I'm going to raise her up on the last day. So I can, as, I, as I look at the, the hand of God on my life, I can emphatically say here this morning, enthusiastically say that I know that the Lord is going to raise me up on the last day. This morning, I want to ask you that. Can you say that about your life? That, that when it comes time for you to depart from here, because we all have an appointment upon our life, when it comes time to depart from you, can you say that the Lord will raise you up on the last day? In verse 44, Jesus continues this thought here. He says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus was sharing even further. He was saying, there's something about the divine purposes of God that, that cause people to come to faith in him. But, but he, he makes this statement, and some people have a hard time with it. Even, even in this passage in John chapter 6, it says in verse 60 that many who heard it thought this was a hard saying, how Jesus was sharing the will of the Father. Who can listen to it? But Jesus said this in John chapter 6. In verse 61, he says, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Then he says in verse 63, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. I hope you're not depending on the flesh to, to bring you to salvation salvation um, to, to a saving faith in God. I hope you're not depending on the flesh. Jesus says here, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And in verse 65 he says, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. You can't come to faith in the Lord. And, and there's countless millions and billions of people across the face of the earth who've turned their back on God and have rejected Him. And according to the words of Jesus here, they cannot come to Him unless the Father draws them. Which, which changes the way we think about things. Which means that we ought to seek the will of the Father when it comes to salvation, as well as the different circumstances in life. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. My, my wife and I, um, in our prayer times together, have, have recognized this principle. And I don't know about you, but we, we, have, we have sensed the need to ask God regularly to draw our children to himself. I don't know of anybody who has more of a burden to pray for their children than a mom and a dad do. And, and we know that, that we can't grandfather our children into the kingdom of God. So what we've recognized is that, that our children, they need to have an encounter with God in order for them to recognize Him. So we've been praying for God to draw them to Himself and to do whatever He needs to do in their lives to give them an encounter with Him. That they would recognize Him and embrace Him as Lord and Savior. Because we believe in the will of the Father as it pertains to the salvation of our children. And we ought to believe in that as it pertains to our parents and our siblings and our co-workers. We ought to understand how the will of God is involved, how the sovereignty of God is involved in the salvation of His people. Someone has said this, imagine you are half a million dollars in debt and someone comes to you and writes out a check for $500,000 saying, this is all for you to cancel your debt. You don't have to do anything but reach out and take it. It's yours. So you take the money and you pay your debt. You're now debt-free and totally in the clear. What do you have to boast about? Can you go around bragging that you had the power, the skill, and the brains to reach out and take that check? Can you talk about 
What a favor you did for your benefactor, taking all that troublesome money off his hands. Does it make any sense? Of course not. You received grace and nothing more. Nothing less. You were impoverished. You received riches from another person. The fact that you're now debt-free is 100% due to your benefactor. 0% due to you. Who then deserves the praise and glory for your salvation? Clearly not you. You have received the riches from the resources of God. His grace has made it possible. That's why we go to Galatians chapter 6, 14 and read, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. We can't boast about receiving these things. All the glory belongs to God. God is the originator, um, the originator of our salvation. He's the orchestrator of our salvation. Salvation had its beginning in Him. It has its completion in Him. And that's something that I want us to think about as we look at the life of Jesus. Jesus always understood that He needed the will of His Father in everything, even when it came to the salvation of people. I want us to look at a couple of illustrations from the Word of God that demonstrate how Jesus yielded to his Father in his earthly ministry, in his work. So not only are we um, to surrender and submit to the will of the Father in our salvation, but also in our ministry work. And, and I want us to look at how Jesus did that here in John chapter 4, verse 3, which says, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And let's skip ahead to verse 27, which says, Then his disciples came back, and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and they were coming to him. In verse 31, Meanwhile the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is through the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. You know, in this illustration, there's an interesting thought there. In verse 4, notice that it said, he had to pass through Samaria. We actually realize that, physically speaking, he didn't have to pass through Samaria. Samaria. There was another way. In fact, biblical scholars tell us that the Jews, the Jews despised the Samaritans. They were a mixed race. And, and so the devout Jews who had kept themselves pure from mixed races um, could not tolerate the Samaritan people. And so history tells us that there was another route around Samaria that was about 12 miles out of the way. And many Jewish people, devout Jews, would go that way to totally avoid Samaria. And yet, in this scripture passage, John, as he's writing his gospel, says Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Why did he have to pass through Samaria? Is my thought here. And, and, and I believe he had to pass through Samaria because Jesus always did the will of his Father. He always sought the will of his Father. So we also read in Scripture that often a great while before day, Jesus would be getting up and he'd be seeking the will of his Father. A great while before day, he would be in prayer asking God to orchestrate his day and direct his steps 
and bring people across his path and his journey such as he would choose. And, and in this illustration, it's no accident that Jesus comes here at the sixth hour. As he had sought the Father, the Lord showed him today, here's a desperate woman in her sixth relationship with another man, having had previously been married five other times, and it never working out for her, looking for an answer in life, desperate, horrible circumstances, and at the sixth hour, Jesus sits down by this well, being weary. You know, he was there because he spent time with the Father and the Father directed him. The Father showed him at the sixth hour today, there's a woman coming to the well. I, I don't know exactly what his dialogue was, was with his Father, but Jesus was where he was supposed to be because he sought the will of the Father. And when this woman, this desperate woman comes along looking for an answer in life, Jesus was there to meet her needs. You know, when I look at Jesus, and we want to learn something from Jesus, we ought to see how he sought the will of the Father. And I, I wonder today, as you examine your life, do you see your life as being fruitful? Are you making a difference in the world today? Are you, are you a fruitful tree where others can come and glean from? And I wonder sometimes, if you look at your life, maybe Maybe you've been a Christian for many years, but you're, you're sitting here and you, you recognize that you, have, you feel like you've never been instrumental in the kingdom of God. You, you haven't walked anybody to faith in the Lord. You haven't prayed with anybody. You haven't witnessed. Maybe that's your life today. And, and I would just like to encourage you this morning. Take a page out of Jesus' book and seek the will of the Father because the Father wants to show you His will. The Father wants to bring people into your path today. If you will seek His will, He will give you the words to say. He will bring the right people along your, your journey in life so you can be fruitful and productive in His kingdom. But you must be seeking the will of the Father. And Jesus does that. You know, there's, there's another illustration here that I would just like to quickly share with you. Luke chapter 19 um, there's a passage there about the little man, what we call Zacchaeus. He climbed up into the sycamore tree to see Jesus that day. Well, all of a sudden, while he's sitting in this tree, Jesus goes down this road. And I want you to notice what it says there in verse 5 of Luke 19. It says, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. How did he know that? How did Jesus know that he must stay at the house of Zacchaeus today? Because he sought the will of the Father. In every decision he made, and he could look back at his life and he could say, I always do the will of my Father. Lord, I have done everything that I've brought your salvation to all those whom you have given me. Jesus could say that. And I just think that's something we could learn from him when we think about the will of the Father and we think about our work and our ministry and our calling in life. And I, I, I tremble at the thought sometimes, and, I, and I've done it too. But we run out the door in the morning sometimes. As a Christian, we run out the door in the morning without having sought the will of the Father. And, and you look at the fruitfulness of Jesus' life, and do we not realize sometimes how wrong we are, how selfish we are, how inconsiderate we are about our, our days and our hours and our weeks? You know, one day we're going to stand before the Lord, and we're going to give an account of how we spend our time. Time is a precious commodity. What if we, before we would run out, our, out, out the door in the morning, we would seek God and say, God, what is your will for me? What if we would even just pray, Lord, put people across my path today whom I can share the good news of the gospel and give me the words to share. Or, Father, help me to see people the way you see them. Give me your eyes today that I would see the brokenness, the pain, and the hurt 
that people have and that I could speak into their life today, that I wouldn't just spend my whole day thinking about myself. What if we would get up early in the morning and we would ask God to orchestrate and direct our day like Jesus did? Maybe we would come across the woman at the well or a Zacchaeus or somebody desperate in need of an answer of living water. You know, going back to this thought of the potter, sometimes we reject the gifts that God has given us, right? I don't know about you, but do you ever, do you ever look at your fellow brother or sister or your friend somewhere and you envy their life and you wish you had what they had? And in a sense, you kind of reject what you have? In, in the parable of talents, Jesus demonstrates that it's the master who decides who gives out the talents and how much to give. Remember, to one he gave five, to one he gave two, to one he gave one. As we think about where we find ourselves at today, whether it's salvation, whether it's ministry work, or our circumstances in life, I would like us to consider what Romans chapter 9, verse 20 says. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Will what is molded say back to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of it the same lump out of the same lump, one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Does God not have the right to make something out of us that He wants to make? Does He not have the right to reveal Himself to us as the Father and, and show us our need for Him and salvation? And to direct our steps every day as it comes to ministry work? Does he also not have the right to put circumstances in our lives that portray his design and will? To give us either five talents or two talents or one talent? Does he not have the right as the maker, as the master, as the creator to do what he wants to do in our lives? Jesus yielded to the will of God in every life circumstance. And I think that's the lesson we can learn. And I want to encourage you this morning too. Um, as we think about the will of the Father and Jesus su subjecting himself to it, in Matthew 26, 39, there's this great moment in Jesus' life, at the end of his life. And going a little further, it says in verse 39 that he fell on his face and he prayed saying, My Father, if it be possible... Let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as you will. Nevertheless not as I will, but as you will. You know, Jesus was presented with a cup of sin. Inside this cup were all the, the travesties, all the, all the sin and all its infestations of, of the entire earth, past, present, and future. In this cup, all the blasphemies all the deceptions, all the adulteries, all the, all the filth of this world. And he had to drink this cup for the redemption of mankind. And in the garden, Jesus is again going to the Father. Remember, this is the same Jesus who in Luke chapter 11, as he was raising Lazarus from the dead, he cried out to the Father and he said, Father, I know that you always hear me. You always hear me. This same Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that the Father always heard him, said this, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What if we looked at life like that? What if we were okay with how the potter has molded us, with the gifts and talents he's given us, 
with how He's shaped our life, with the journey that He's put in front of us. You know, I, I think for many of us here today, sometimes we take the attitude of the atheist. The atheist has a bumper sticker that says, life sucks and then you die. You've seen it before. Life sucks and then you die. And I wonder if there's some of you here this morning that have adopted that mantra in your life where you're like, you know, my life's miserable. You don't know what I deal with every day. You don't know the horrible circumstances that I'm under. And, and so I would invite you to consider the Lord Jesus and his words where he says, Nonetheless, not my will, but yours. Can the, can the potter not decide to do with our life what he chooses to do with our life? But I think very often, we're a fair-weather Christian. You know, when we hear the term fair-weather friends, we're talking about the kind of friend that's with, that's with you in the good times. When everything's going well with you and and your bank account's doing good, and, and you're going out for all kinds of meals and enjoying life. You know, those kinds of friends love to be around you. But when you fall upon hardships, that's a fair-weather friend. They're gone. A fair-weather Christian is kind of like that too. A fair-weather Christian says, God, I'm going to serve you as long as I get all the riches, I get all the possessions, all the good things and health and everything else health, wealth, and prosperity. I get all those things. I'm going to serve you. But as soon as difficult circumstances come our way, all of a sudden we're running the other way. All of a sudden we're like, yeah, that's not for me. I didn't sign up for that. I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not going to Bible study anymore. I'm, not, I'm done with this. You know, I want to be like that person. Why does my life have to look like this? So we have this attitude. And it, and I realize that today, sitting here, some of you are going through a difficult journey in life. More difficult than the people around you. Some of you are dealing with handicapped children. I can't imagine the difficulty that some of you have to go with every day as a result of those things. Some of you are, as, as women, you have dealt with miscarriage after miscarriage. And your heart is so full of grief, you don't even know what to do with yourself. And you look to your neighbor next door, and they have beautiful children. And you long to hold one in your own arms. Some of you are barren. Some of you can't have a child. And you long for a child to hold in your arms. And you can't. And it's hard for you to even come to church because there's so many little ones here. Some of you are single in your life and you long for a companion in your life. But your journey's different. And in your singleness, there's loneliness and there's grief. And you long for a life that would be different than what you're living. Now, I've talked to some of you guys and I know that some of you men wish you had a marriage where you had a wife that loved you and cared about you. And unfortunately, that's not your case. And I, I say all these things because doesn't the potter have a right to do with the clay according to how he wants to shape it? Maybe your thought is that's easy for you to say. But I wonder if you would be willing today to say like Jesus did, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. If you would be willing to sit here today and say, God, the journey you have for me is okay with me. I'm okay with the path that I'm on because I know that I'm living in your will. And I know you can make beautiful things out of my life, even right where I am. I wonder if today we would say, I'm okay with the journey that I'm on. Yeah, I, I wish things would be different, but maybe this is the cross that I have to bear. Maybe it's okay that 
My life doesn't look like the person next to me. We can learn from Jesus in this. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says of Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, verse 6, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Of his visions, his, his wishes, his dreams, his, de- his comparisons, his desires to be like anybody else, says he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So here's my, my, my concluding thought here this morning. If we want to learn from Jesus, what is God saying to you today about how you might need to empty yourself? Maybe you need to experience the death of a vision. Maybe you need to die to whatever future you had hoped you would have. Because God has chosen to alter your journey. Maybe has, He has changed your journey. Maybe He has put something in your life that other people will never experience. But that He has a desire to enact in your life to bear fruit for the sake of His kingdom. And I wonder if you would be willing today to take in the example of Jesus and say, Nevertheless, not as I will, Lord, but as you will. Do with me as as you want to do in my life. Joni Erickson Tata um, was 18 years old. Young, vibrant, healthy, athletic, young woman. And she gets into an accident through diving and she becomes paralyzed from the neck down. At 18 years old, she was subjected to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. She's still alive today and spends her days encouraging people and submitting to the will of the Father. Beautiful, beautiful testimony. I want to share what she says about her life. In one of her books, she's written this. I sure hope I can bring this wheelchair to heaven. Now I know that's not theologically correct, she says, but I hope to bring it and put it in a little corner of heaven and then in my new perfect glorified body, standing on grateful glorified legs, I'll stand next to my Savior holding his nail-pierced hands. And I'll say, thank you, Jesus. And he will know that I mean it because he knows me. And he'll recognize me from the fellowship We're now sharing in his sufferings. And I will say, Jesus, do you see that wheelchair? You were right when you said that in this world we would have trouble because that thing was a lot of trouble. But the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. It never would have happened had you not given me the bruising of the blessing of that wheelchair. Then she says the real ticker tape parade of praise will begin. And all of earth will join in the party. And at that point, Christ will open up our eyes to the great fountain of joy in his heart for us beyond all that we ever experienced on earth. And when we're able to stop laughing and crying, the Lord Jesus really will wipe away our tears. And she says this, I find it so poignant that finally at the point when I do have the use of my arms to wipe away my own tears, I won't have to because God will. You know, she has made the rest of her life a ministry for the sake of the kingdom. She was okay to say, God, I'm okay with the direction that you've chosen for me. I'm okay with the journey that you've chosen for me. I wonder if we are. You know, one of the the songs we sing here in church, It Is Well With My Soul, was written out of great loss as well. You know, the story is written about a, a woman and her daughters who had traveled to England. And Horatio Spafford, the writer of the song, stayed behind in Chicago. It was during the great Chicago fire where he lost a lot of his business. Things were already changing in his life. Well, in the middle of the ocean, 
um, through a shipwreck, he lost four of his daughters, all four of his daughters. And his wife arrives in England and sends back a telegram saying, saved alone. And he takes the next ship. And he, he heads over to be rejoined with his wife and in, in the middle of the ocean where the ship went down, the, 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 the captain says, this is where your four daughters perished. And he writes this song. He writes this song that says, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You know, when we accept the will of the Father in our lives, we can say that. In the middle of the most tragic circumstances in our life, we can say, God, thank you. I know you haven't abandoned me. Thank you for the, the circumstances in my life because I know they're bringing fruit to you and to your kingdom. It takes maturity in the life of us as a believer to be able to say, Lord, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with what you need to do in my life in order to use me to your utmost. And even if I have to die to my vision, my dreams and my aspirations, it's okay, Lord. May God grant us the grace to do that. May we be willing to be molded by the potter and shaped into the vessel that he chooses for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you here this morning, Father, I'm aware of the fact that you are sovereign in all these things. You are divine. We are here this morning because of your divine will. And so, Father, I just pray for each soul here this morning, each one hearing these words. Father, if there's some here that don't know you personally, they have experienced by divine appointment the gospel this morning, Lord. They've heard of a God who's given all. They've heard of the, the fact that they can look to the Son and believe in Him and have eternal life and be raised up on the last day. So, Lord, I pray that as you've spoken to the souls here this morning, that none would harden their hearts to you. Lord, that they would recognize that they are here because you have called them to be here. And that they would receive you today as Lord and Savior. And, Lord, I pray for those hurting here this morning who are going through a difficult journey in life. And maybe they feel lonely and isolated, and misunderstood. And Lord, I pray that you would reach these hearts this morning, and that you would grant surrender in their lives, and that you would give them the willingness today to say, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Lord, I know that's a gift from you, and I just pray that you would give that gift of surrender to each one of these individuals. Lord, you're able to do that. And Father, I pray that you would do that. And Lord, I pray that you would draw us to yourself, each one of us, Lord. Give us all submission to you in a willingness, Lord, to allow you to shape our lives according to your will. Even like Johnny Erickson Tata, Lord, willing to bear with a wheelchair. May we also be willing, Lord, to bear with whatever circumstances you're calling us to. And in the midst of those circumstances, Lord, may we give you glory and honor and devotion. In Jesus' name, amen.